exciting collaboration between the Bellman University Honors Program and Bellman University uh, TEDx. Uh, first, before I forget, before I say anything else, a huge thank you to the TEDx uh, Bellman uh, University crew uh, for run, upgrading our technology uh, significantly. In previous iterations of this event, our technology cave paintings, right, uh, hollering loudly into the void. But now we have real tech, uh, real production values, uh, thanks to our wonderful uh, Bellman uh, TEDx crew. So a big thank you uh, to them. We have uh, four uh, incredible uh, presenters that you're going to be hearing from this evening, four uh, completing uh, honors seniors. I will say a little bit before each of them present about why exactly they're incredible. Uh, perhaps you know because you know them, uh, but you'll hear more about their bias before each of them uh, present. One of them, uh, Xenia Nava, is joining us virtually uh, because she is an athlete and injured her knee in her last ever soccer game. Uh, but we don't just pivot at Bellarmine, we pirouette, right? Uh, so we have pirouetted to Microsoft Teams and she'll be joining us uh, virtually uh, for that, for her part of the presentation. I want to say a few uh, quick uh, business items. If you didn't already, if you could please, please, please do us a big favor uh, and sign in at some point. If you're a student, we have swipe cards. Uh, but also, everyone, if you could sign in just with your name and your email address, uh, TED, uh, which I believe is short for Theodore, right now, no, I'm just kidding. It's an abbreviation for something. But TED wants everyone's uh, email uh, and uh, name, and so we can send that information along to TED. We really appreciate that. That is over there at that table. Also at that table, uh, just like every fun uh, rock concert you've ever been to, uh, we have some, some uh, honors merch, you know, you love. Uh, merch, right? Some of that is merch that we have on hand, and we also have a QR code that goes for our website. Uh, I don't know, why would you drink out of a coffee mug that doesn't have the Honors logo on it when you can buy one that does? Uh, and even better, uh, all of this great merch uh, goes to uh, help us, uh, the proceeds from it go to help support and fund the Honors program. Uh, wonderful things like you're going to hear about uh, today uh, from these students. So, you know, uh, you can do all of your holiday shopping tonight, right? And then you'll be done. That would be great. Uh, so sign in at, at that table over there, see our merch folks. Uh, after the presentations this evening, we'll have a Q&A, and then after that Q&A, we'll have a reception in the McGrath Gallery, which is right over here. Believe me, you're gonna wanna go. The food is very good. Uh, uh, I made it, but no, I did not. But I did check it out, and it looks really good. Uh, and the other, the even more important part is that you're gonna hear about Kimmy's Project, and Kimmy's Project is an art installation which is currently installed in the McGrath Gallery, and spoiler alert, it is amazing. So you're gonna to wanna to check that out, uh, get some food, uh, and, and have, a, have a soda uh, on us. Uh, and then, because we have all sorts of rocket things going on tonight, there is a play, uh, Angel Street, uh, that's happening at seven o'clock that Samantha Hacker is involved with. I believe it's sold out, it's but, sold out. but maybe you could just charge the doors or something, I don't know. But uh, maybe you bought a ticket already, because uh, it's sold out. But that'll be great, but it's also tomorrow at two, two and, seven. and seven, and on Sunday at two. Uh, I believe it's an adaptation of the film Gaslight, is that right? Yes. Uh, so it sounds great. Uh, and we have several honor students involved in that. It should be a really uh, remarkable production. And then, happening here in Crawley, we have the Sondheim uh, Review uh, this evening. Uh, so a wonderful singing, I believe that's also at 7 o'clock. So you can see these presentations, uh, you can have some food, you can check out Kenny's Awesome Art, and then you can be entertained uh, basically for the, for the rest of the night. We've got you covered here. Uh, so anyway, well thank you all uh, for being, uh, being here, and thank you for your support uh, of, these, of these incredible uh, students. Uh, first, this evening, we are going to hear uh, from Chloe uh, Powell. Uh, Chloe Powell is a communications major uh, at Bellarmine University. She is graduating in mere days from now uh, in, in December. She has also been a member of our women's cross country and track team. I understand she is very fast. She didn't write that in her bio, but I've, I've, heard, I've heard that. Uh, she's involved in Bellarmine Christian Fellowship and club soccer. Uh, her passions include uh, combating poverty, student ministry, and apologetics, which I'm sure Dr. Spilliotis is really excited to hear. Uh, her plan after graduation is to work for an international nonprofit that fights poverty in developing countries uh, through an empowering and holistic uh, 
uh, crush. She didn't put this in her bio, but she's a quintuplet. Uh, I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, that's one of the first things I, I learned about her, uh, and it's really great. And tonight, she is going to be presenting on effective community development and informal settlements through analysis of the Kiberia slum in Kenya. And I want to add to you, uh, Chloe applied for, competed for, and received a very uh, generous grant from the Bellman Women's Council to support this work. And they're not just you know, handing out money, it's because it's a great project, but we really appreciate their support of Chloe and as of our students more generally. So without further ado, I'm gonna crunch my way to my seat. And, and, and Chloe, you're up. In the words of Harvard University professor Michael Fairbanks, Many people have a heart for those living in poverty. That's the easy part. But very few have a mind for how to fight poverty well. My thesis is about what effective community development looks like in informal settlements, specifically through analysis of the Kibera slum in Kenya. I had the privilege of doing an internship back in the summer of 2021 through a nonprofit uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya, which is when I was first able to uh, experience uh, some of the challenges that Kibera faces. Before I jump into the content, I just want to thank my thesis advisor, Dr. Frank Hunchins, for all of his support uh, throughout this process. That's him over there. Um, <laughs> as well as the Bellarmine Women's Council for giving me funding to go back to Kibera this past summer and do research. So we'll start by briefly looking at the current model of aid and development and some background into the Kibera slum specifically. And then we'll spend most of our time uh, today digging deeper into the personal research I was able to do in Kibera, including entrepreneurship and income generation, access and use of various financial ser services, NGOs or non-governmental organizations in the slum dedicated to fighting poverty and corruption. Consider the mission of an organization called Tom's Shoes. The basic principle of this company is one for one. So when someone buys a pair of shoes from Tom's Shoes, they will send a pair to a child in need. And that sounds like a great idea, right? But what happens to the local shoemakers and sellers in those impoverished communities? Imagine what happens to their business when a big truck full of free Tom's Shoes shows up. That community is now dependent on Tom's Shoes because the local shoe businesses are gonna go out of business. And now if Tom Shoes ever stops and decides to target a different area, that community is actually left off worse than it started. Humanitarian aid, aid that fights immediate needs such as food and clothing, that's become the permanent model of poverty alleviation. So free supplies, free food and clothing and medicine is flooded into these communities and they become stuck in this cycle of dependence on handouts and no true development can take place in the local economies because businesses have no incentive to produce their own products. A quote that really stands out to me is a quote from the co-founder of a small solar panel company in Haiti. And he says, your goal should be to give me a fishing rod, teach me how to fish, and then move out. But after 40 years, if you're still here, there's a problem. In many impoverished areas around the world, NGOs stay in communities for decades, handing out free supplies year after year while crippling the economy and wondering why poverty isn't decreasing. In 2016, Kenya received $2.4 billion in official development assistance, making it one of the world's largest recipients of international aid. In Kibera alone, there are over 500 NGOs dedicated to fighting poverty, which is staggering in relation to its small size of only about two to two and a half square kilometers. Despite all the money that's been poured into Kibera, people's homes are still small and deteriorating, garbage lines the streets, and people still live on about $2 a day there must be a better approach to development. And that is what my thesis uh, seeks to figure out. Kibera is one of the largest and most densely populated slums in the world. It's approximately half the size of Central Park in New York, but it has about a million people. So a little audience participation here. Uh, Kibera's annual growth rate is approximately 17%. Can anyone guess what Louisville's annual growth rate is? Dr. Fanless said less than two. Any other guesses? 0.7 to 0.8% annually. Kibera's density rate is approximately 2,500 people per hectare, and one hectare is equal to about two and a half acres. Can anyone guess what Tokyo's density rate is? 
throw it out, somebody. 143 people per hectare. So that just gives some context for how rapidly Kibera is growing and how densely the people are packed together. Kibera is broken up into villages, as they're called, and each village has its own village chief and officials. Village chiefs are selected by the government and they remain in power for life. And that is an important concept that we'll come back to. So as I mentioned earlier, I was able to go to uh, Nairobi, Kenya for three weeks this past summer and do 107 uh, in-person interviews with residents living in the Kibera slum there. So the first two questions that I asked residents were what their favorite and least favorite things about living in Kibera are. So for the least favorite things, the three most cited answers were the unclean environment, bad or congested houses, and theft or insecurity. Kibera is recognized as one of the worst slums in the world. Because it's an informal settlement, the government has no obligation to develop the infrastructure or provide basic services. And the land is also owned by the government, so residents have no property rights. This is a huge hindrance to development in Kibera because at any point the government can come in and choose to construct a railroad or building and demolish any houses or businesses they want. And this has happened many times in Kibera's history. So there's little incentive or at least real concerns before an individual might choose to invest in their home or business. Kibera doesn't have any garbage collection system or dumping sites, so garbage and waste builds up quite drastically in the streets, and this is one of the most visible problems in Kibera, as you can see. Kibera has the title of being the, slum, or the community of flying toilets, which is waste tied up in bags and thrown out into the streets. The average house size is somewhere between 9 by 9 and 12 by 12 feet, and often houses up to five or more people. These houses, or shacks as they're called, are often very visibly deteriorating. Now, despite all the obvious needs in Kibera, the slum does have many assets. When residents were asked about their favorite things about living in Kibera, the three most cited answers were how cheap and affordable life is there, the community or unity that the slum has, and how close Kibera is to town. It's a little over three miles away from the Nairobi city center. There are an incredible number of small businesses in Kibera, which allows residents to have access to a wide variety of products and services tailored to their needs and purchasing power. So people with the same income level living in another place would be in a far worse situation. A 2012 report of The Economist goes so far to say that Kibera may be the most entrepreneurial place on the planet. Many residents engage in multiple different kinds of income generating activities, such as running two businesses or running a business and also doing casual work on the weekends. Over half of the residents I interviewed had at least one small business, about a third did casual work, and very few had formal employment. Average income was roughly 71 US dollars per month or about $2.37 per day. So often these businesses are not these thriving businesses, but it's enough to keep the residents heads above water and provide a bit of stability and income. There was a really wide variety of different types of businesses the residents had. So not only were there basic products sold, such as food and clothing, but also movie salons, uh, cyber cafes, jewelry, entertainment, things like that. Now, there are only a few market areas in Kibera where residents are actually allowed to set up a business. So these residents pay a monthly fee that's collected by the city council and submitted to the government. If a resident sets up a business that isn't in one of these market areas, the correct procedure would be that the business owner would be given a notice to vacate the area. If not, the business would be destroyed. However, Kenya is an incredibly corrupt country, which we'll talk about more later in this presentation. So in Kibera, if a resident sets up a business outside one of these market areas, city council officials just make them pay a bribe every so often, pocket the money, and let them stay. One of the residents estimates that 75% of businesses in Kibera are in these restricted areas because there's just not enough room for the overwhelming number of businesses. Residents have really little incentive to expand in these areas because they never know when their business could be destroyed. Maybe somewhat surprisingly, residents have access to lots of different financial services. One of the most popular options in the slum is savings groups, which are when 10 to 30 individuals agree to meet weekly or biweekly and save a certain amount each week. 
As their savings build up, they can distribute loans to members of the group with an agreed upon interest rate and loan terms. Residents also have access to many banks and a service called M-Pesa, which is basically a less formal banking service that allows users to save and transfer money as well as access loans. 56% of uh, residents interviewed were in at least one savings group, with 38% of those being in two savings groups at one time, and 7% being in three savings groups at one time. Almost half of the residents uh, that I interviewed either currently had a loan or have had one in the last six months. And the three most cited reasons for taking out a loan were for a business, uh, to pay for school fees, and for various household items. Unfortunately, repayment rate was not great. 64% of those who had a loan had missed at least one repayment on their loan, and many had missed several repayments. Interest on most of these loans was about 10%, which is really pretty reasonable there, especially compared to loan sharks, as they're called in more rural areas, who often charge outrageous interest fees. So just to provide two brief examples of residents who had loans, there was a 23-year-old male. He took out a loan of a little less than three US dollars through M-Pesa because he needed it to survive. He was supposed to pay the loan back in two weeks, but at the time of the interview, he was about a month past the deadline with interest increasing by about four cents each day. So at the current moment, he's just stuck because he gets casual work so irregularly that he just doesn't have enough money to pay the loan back. There was also a 51-year-old male. He took out a loan of a little less than 50 US dollars uh, through a bank back in April of 2020 to pay for school fees. He was supposed to pay the loan back by December of 2020, but he's only paid back about a third of it, and he now owes almost $33 just in interest because of how many times he's missed repayment. So interest is currently at 67% for him. So from my interviews, it was obvious that residents value access to these financial services and access to loans. A 33-year-old female resident said, savings groups are really helping because you never know what will happen tomorrow. Access to loans allows residents to brink any emergencies that may pop up. However, it seems that for many, low and irregular income makes repayment hard. As I mentioned earlier, there are over 500 NGOs in Kibera. One of the residents in particular really had a passion and understanding for how NGOs should engage in development effectively. He said, NGOs give people food and the people are dependent. Instead of creating independence into the lives of people in Kibera, they create more dependence to the point where these Kibera residents cannot live without these programs running. I think such programs should be wiped out of Kibera. Unless someone has sustainability in mind, they should not be running in Kibera. He went on to explain that most residents have the mentality that NGOs should offer all their services for free and residents shouldn't have to do anything for them because that is the expectation that's been set for decades. He described it like a virus. One thing I was really shocked to learn about is how many NGOs in the slum residents perceive to be corrupt. So there are no formal statistics, but one resident estimated that 60% of NGOs in Kibera are started by Kenyans because they know there's a lot of money to be made in charity. When the donor money floods in, they keep the majority for themselves. Another resident estimated this number to be closer to 80%. Other NGOs may be started with good intentions by the owner. However, at least according to the residents, um, corrupt management unbeknown to the owner who may live outside the slum minimizes the NGO's effects. A 51-year-old male resident said, if the owner of the NGO sends two bottles of water, the resident will get a small cup. So there are two main problems with NGOs in Kibera. There's the ones that are just giving out free stuff and crippling Kibera's economy, and then there's just corrupt NGOs, where even if the owner is mindful of how to engage in development effectively, uh, corrupt, corruption within is minimizing the NGO's effects. So that brings us to the topic of corruption. And this is something that we've seen woven throughout many of the other topics discussed up to this point. Kenya is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. 73% of respondents said they have personally experienced corruption. Some common examples were having to pay a bribe to get a job and corruption from police officers and village chiefs and officials. Many of the residents gave the example of an initiative the government started to provide cleaning jobs in Kenya. Those most in need are the ones who are supposed to be selected for this program. 
However, uh, officials just uh, give this job to friends and family and then make the people the program is supposed to help pay a bribe to be selected for the program. During a previous election season, there was actually a viral video of many village chiefs telling residents they had to vote for a certain candidate if they wanted to get paid through this cleaning job. And even though the evidence is on camera, no consequential action's been taken. One of the residents was explaining to me that back when she was married, her husband beat her after she confronted him about an expensive item he sold that they had bought together. So she reported him to the village chief. He was questioned and told to refund the money but he never did. She later went back for a follow-up, but she was told to drop the case. She later found out that the ex-husband had bribed the village chief. David Rakiwa, a Kenyan journalist writes, corruption will never fail to be the reason for almost all vices in the country. It has taken over the well-being of Kenya with leaders being the initiators. You can hardly find a job in Kenya without connections, and this is caused by tribalism and nepotism, which are norms in the country today. Kenya has had numerous anti-corruption campaigns over the years, intervention from the US, various Kenyan presidents saying they were gonna crack down on corruption, and nothing's changed. Virtually everyone in power in the Kenyan government is corrupt, and people with money and power in Kenya can bribe themselves out of very literally almost any situation. I wish I had an easy fix for development in Kibera, but as I've sifted through my data and the research, I realized that really the problem is much bigger and more complex than that. I think the ultimate problem is corruption and there are so many other issues that stem from that. Long lasting change in Kibera will take multifaceted partnerships, collaboration with local and national governments and significant community involvement to deal with complex root issues and systematic corruption. In Kenya, the laws against corruption are there but enforcement is lacking because those in charge of enforcement are corrupt. The fight against corruption needs to be spearheaded and it will require that the people of Kibera come together. I believe it will take Rosa Parks type of people and residents coming along alongside those people. I think an educational and legal advocacy NGO can really help in educating residents about their rights and giving them a voice and legal help in the beginning. But ultimately, this will only succeed long term if the people are empowered themselves. Some practical measures that I think could be beneficial in Kibera include a network of NGOs where these findings are discussed and there's collaboration and accountability. I think NGOs should have to provide much uh, more transparent documentation of their work and release financial statements to the public so that residents are well informed. Obviously, not every NGO is going to be willing to collaborate, but hopefully there could be some ability to weed out the corrupt NGOs and tackle some of these issues in a more unified front. One of the biggest changes that I think needs to happen in Kibera is for the village chiefs to not be selected by the government. They need to be elected by the people. They should also have much shorter terms, such as one four year term, instead of being able to remain in power for life. This way, uh, residents can elect a village chief who's honest and will actually deal justly with cases brought before him. That alone would make a huge change in Kibera. I also think there should be advocacy for the market areas uh, in Kibera to be expanded. I understand restricting some areas uh, to create a bit of order, but there's no reason these market areas shouldn't be expanded so that residents can start a business without fear of eviction. This could have a big impact on residents' abilities to invest more in their businesses and increase profit. Ultimately, these changes won't happen overnight. They'll take years to take effect and will require partnerships and collaboration across multiple different organizations and sectors. These are issues that have been affecting Kibera for decades, and as I mentioned earlier, are often much more complex than the surface may reveal. I'm so inspired and hopeful for the potential I see in Kibera. I'm amazed at the residents' work ethics, their joy, and their desire to succeed in life. If only given the opportunities to do so, I believe they will flourish in fulfilling the dreams and goals they have for themselves and for their families. Thank you.
Nathan May will have questions at, at the end of our, of our presentations, right? Uh, and Nathan is a physics major uh, with a mathematics uh, minor. Uh, his uh, incredible uh, research that he's going to be presenting this evening is rooted in an internship that he did uh, last spring uh, with the Department of Energy's Oak, Li Oak Ridge uh, National uh, Laboratory uh, in Tennessee. I always think of Oak Ridge with the Oak Ridge boys, but there's also smart people like Nathan there uh, and doing uh, really fascinating and interesting uh, work. Among his many other uh, awards and accomplishments, he's a Monsignor Horgan Scholar, a Knights of Honor Scholar, a Bellman Trustee Scholar, a Bellman Grant recipient, a Gauss Family Scholarship Award. He was on the Dean's List, and he has presented this research already uh, in multiple venues, including Kentucky uh, Honors Roundtable, uh, SESP, or SESAPS, uh, and then a Kentucky Academy uh, of Sciences. After graduation, uh, he plans to obtain a master's degree in medical physics, which I think is a really fascinating field, uh, with the goal of pursuing a career in clinical radiation therapy. So let's welcome Nathan up to the stage. Excellent. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so as you heard, I'm Nathan Mayer, and uh, I'm very excited to have this opportunity to speak with all of you about some of the research I completed as part of my honors thesis here at Bellarmine. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to make a few acknowledgments, uh, namely, as you heard from Dr. Blanford, um, this research was completed as part of the Student Undergraduate Laboratory Internship Program at Oak Ridge National Laboratory under the direction of Dr. Benjamin Lowry, and as such received funding from the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, additionally, I'd like to thank some of my Bellarmine uh, faculty sponsors, including uh, Dr. Mohamed Salim from the Physics Department and Dr. Jen Miller from the Mathematics Department. So returning to my project proper, um, my research involved exploring cathodoluminescence evident features of tungsten disulfide, molybdenum disulfide, and tungsten sulfide selenide, which are a series of 2D nanostructures. Now, I recognize that that's a pretty intimidating and technical sounding title. <laughs> But I'd like to take this opportunity to assure you that we're going to break it down part by part and start by exploring some of the background scientific concepts you need to know in order to understand the significance of this kind of research. So to begin, um, you may be asking, what do we mean by exploring these features? How exactly is it that we're talking about uh, collecting and studying data on these materials? Um, to give you a little bit of a point of reference for anyone who doesn't know, uh, you may have heard me refer to these structures as nanostructures, two-dimensional nanostructures. Um, so the nano prefix tends to refer to units of measurement of an incredibly small size. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a point of reference, the width of a single human red blood cell is about one micrometer, and we're dealing in the nanometer scale, so that is a thousand times smaller than that. So obviously when you're starting to deal with things that are that small, you're highly dependent on technology to help facilitate imaging creating images of this kind of a subject uh, in the field of microscopy. So now, uh, some of the microscopes you might be familiar with, like in the top left, um, are known as uh, compound optical microscopes. And these are excellent research tools and have their own place in scientific study, but they're a little bit inadequate for our needs. Um, due to a number of features, um, optical microscopes, for one, rely on your subject either being able to reflect light or otherwise have light pass through them as they use light and a series of lenses and mirrors in order to magnify an image of an object. So, our, uh, so there are some limitations to how clear of an image these kinds of microscopes are able to produce and how small of an image they're able to magnify. Uh, especially when you start to get into these nanoscale domains, um, the number of lenses that would be required uh, and the strength of the light source are completely impractical. It's, it's just a technological limitation that doesn't really exist. Um, however, uh, light is not the only medium that we use to produce images or magnified images of objects. Uh, as part of electron microscopy, specifically scanning electron microscopy, which we use as part of this project, um, you are able to use a high energy electron beam to irradiate the surface of the material you're trying to study. 
Now, as a result of that process, you raise the energy level of the component electrons of the material that you're trying to study. Electrons being, you know, the uh, very small negatively charged subatomic particles that orbit the atomic nucleus. So as you increase the energy level of these electrons with your high energy electron beam, you can actually start to raise their energy so much so that they actually begin to break off from the, your material themselves and escape as these secondary electrons. And by collecting these electrons, we're able to produce a magnified image of our subject. Uh, the advantage of this kind of imaging technology is clearly demonstrated in some of our images here. You're able to produce a much higher resolution image. Uh, on the left, we see an optical mic microscopy image of a whole culture of cells, whereas on the right, we see an image of a single instance of those cells produced via scanning electron microscopy. You can see that it's a much higher detail image and is able to uh, represent a much smaller area of what we're interested in studying. However, even scanning electron microscopy has its own drawbacks when it comes to imaging. Uh, you can only image the very surface of your material. It provides no information about the underlying structure, which is where we come into the second part of our title, cathodoluminescence. So cathodol cathodoluminescence refers to the emission of light in response to stimulation by high energy electrons. So when we're using a scanning electron micro microscope, our high energy electron beam does not have sufficient energy to cause all constituent electrons of the material we're trying to study to actually break off as secondary electrons. Some of them, as described by st solid state band theory, are raised from their stable level valence band up to this higher energy conduction band. And in the context of a scanning electron microscope, your, my, your electron beam is scanning very quickly, line by line, over the surface of your entire material. So it doesn't stay in one spot for very long. Once it moves on past that spot, those electrons want to fall back down from the conduction level, back down to their stable valence level state. Uh, the separation between these two areas is called a band gap. We'll come back to that later. Um, so as it's falling back down, making this energy level transition, structural defects in that material, be that where an individual atom or molecule is missing, from the crystalline matrix that makes up the structure, and there's like a hole in that crystal structure, or there is impurities where you have atoms of another element that are present in that material. In either case, uh, it's able to cause that electron to be temporarily trapped as it falls from conduction to valence band, uh, which results in this emission of several distinct wavelengths of light. Now, by collecting and focusing these wavelengths of light, we're able to produce a second kind of electron microscopy image called a cathodoluminescence image. And these images have the ultimate benefit of being able to give us some kind of a clue as to, under, as to the underlying structure of the material. Because as we said, how it emits light, the wavelength, the intensity of that light is all determined by how that structure is made up and how it ends up trapping these atoms or these electrons in this energy transfer. So now that we know a little bit about some of the background scientific processes that we're using as part of this experiment, what about the materials that we're imaging themselves? Uh, you've heard me refer to them several times as two-dimensional nanostructures, but what exactly does that mean? So these materials are considered two-dimensional because of the fact that they are a single molecule in thickness. They are as close as a material can be to flat uh, as is possible while still maintaining a uh, contiguous structure. So, and they are nanostructures because of the fact that even at this single molecule thin level, they continue to manifest this very ordered, arranged crystal structure in these very nice repeating tessellated shapes. So for each of our materials individually, looking at the exact materials that we were studying as part of this project, we notice uh, particular features about their composition. So our, for our tungsten disulfide, shown on the far left, you'll notice that it has a top and bottom layer made up of sulfur atoms with a layer of tungsten sandwiched in between, whereas our molybdenum disulfide is much the same. It has a top and bottom layer of sulfur with those molybdenum atoms. These are side views in both cases, uh, at the top represented in A there, and then over here in B. Uh, with that molybdenum being 
sandwiched in between. Um, however, uh, what's more unique is our tungsten sulfide selenide, which is what we refer to as a heterostructure or a Janus structure. And that's of particular interest because you'll notice that we see no repetition of sides, that both the top, middle, and bottom of our crystalline matrix are made up of their own elemental composition. You have selenium on top, and then tungsten in the middle, and then sulfur on the bottom. And that's so named uh, as a Janus structure. It's a rather whimsical name derived from Roman mythology. Um, after Janus, the uh, Roman god of possibility, who's often depicted having two faces, just as our material has two faces of unique composition on the top and bottom. So we've talked a lot about what it, exactly it is that we're studying, but the question remains, why is this worthy of scientific study in the first place? What is it that we hope to accomplish as part of this research? And what's the greater technological context of our research proper? Um, 2D nanomaterials in general already demonstrate a variety of useful properties on their own. Our ability to manufacture them is still a relatively recent development. And as, but even with that being the case, they've shown a lot of promise in several technological fields. Uh, they are excellent thermal and electrical conductors and as such have a variety of applications when it comes to things like particle detectors, batteries, solar cells, and other such fields. Um, a lot of that, dom that when it comes to those fields, though, a lot of that discussion ends up being dominated by another 2D nanostructure known as graphene, which is a carbon-based 2D nanostructure. It has the advantage of being very cheap and easy to manufacture, as well as easy to source the component materials for. But our materials, our tungsten disulfide, molybdenum disulfide, and tungsten sulfide selenide, have the advantage when it comes to research of having all of the benefits of graphene in addition to having this level of optical activity through cathodoluminescence that we discussed earlier. And that matters when it comes to the application of an even more emergent technological field known as quantum processing and quantum computing. So in order to, for a material to be relevant for these kinds of structures and to build into this field, it needs to have this precise ability to manipulate and control light at the nanoscale. Uh, it needs to possess a band gap. Um, graphene, in most contexts, has either no or very little band gap, whereas our materials possess a significant band gap, which we can exploit to control light and use it for this precise state control that enables storing and processing information through the use of photons when it comes to quantum computing. So when it comes to our experiment proper and what it was that we specifically hoped to accomplish, our goal was to take a series of both secondary electron and cathodoluminescence images of each of our materials. And we were interested in targeting any areas where we saw non-uniform optical behavior. We were interested in looking for areas where we would see part of our material light up brighter under cathodoluminescence conditions than another part of our material or at a different wavelength than the rest of the structure. And it was our hope that if we could pin down what caused these kinds of abnormalities in the structural sense, those uh, defects could be replicated in the future when it comes to actually manufacturing these structures to control and manipulate light on the nanoscale, which, as we talked about, has a number of technological applications. For our experiment itself, uh, we took samples of each of our three materials, which were grown on these very tiny glass plates um, that were part of these little containers called stubs. And then we screwed them into the stage platform for our electron microscope. Then that stage platform, which comprised part of our electron microscope chamber, is then closed. The air is pumped out of the chamber, creating vacuum conditions. And then we select either around a single flake or a cluster of flakes of our material, about a 10 nanometer window of acquisition. We, using uh, electron microscopy software, we essentially divide this area of acquisition into a very thin grid and then have our electron beam scan over this grid, spending a certain amount of time in each of the individual boxes that comprise that grid. We collect the light and the secondary electrons that it gives in response to this stimulation. And then we use those to produce a series of images based off of it. Uh, as part of this procedure, a lot of what our time ended up being spent on was actually evaluating our, Im our different imaging conditions and how we can maximize those in order to get the highest resolution images possible while also avoiding damage to our samples. Uh, so 
we could control the beam current, the beam energy, how tightly we divided our acquisition window into a grid, and then how long our electron beam was spent centered on each of the individual boxes of said grid, um, which we refer to as our exposure time. Uh, as you increased each of these factors, you would produce a higher resolution image up into a point. Uh, you would start to cause what we refer to as carbon contamination, which you can kind of see in this image. Note that you see a very large or a very distinct square uh, around the area that we were trying to image, which happens as, as you start to increase your beam current, your beam energy, your acquisition time, et cetera, uh, hydrocarbon contaminants, so biological matter that manages to get into your electron chamber before you induce a vacuum, start to get pulled out of the environment and deposited on top of what you're trying to produce an image of. And it kind of ruins our images because, like we said, uh, carbon and graphene, they do not uh, experience cathodoluminescence activity. It kind of just builds this big opaque layer on top of the things that we're trying to image. So starting to look at some of our raw data results for our experiment, uh, we begin with this sample of molybdenum disulfide. There are a couple of things I'd like to point out so you can uh, try to parse through some of the data and understand what it is that we're doing. So in our bottom right here, we see our full spectrum of results. Um, so as we're producing a cathodoluminescence image, which we see both of these are fragments of that image, we are collecting light across a large span of different wavelengths, and those all get built into a series of composite images that we can kind of scrub through and look for the areas where we see the most things happening. Uh, at the top left, we see our secondary electron survey, which again shows us the basic surface level features of our material, but nothing about its optical activity, and so nothing about its internal structure. You'll notice for the molybdenum disulfide that we see two areas of key activity at 450 nanometers and 575 nanometers. I'm going to focus on the 575 nanometer area for the moment because I think it best demonstrates what I'm trying to show here, which is that this is what we expect to see. This is very normal behavior for the material at a couple set wavelengths, which are these big spikes. You'll notice that these correspond to the actual values we see. Um, the entirety of the flake will light up and we'll see that that brightness is largely the same over the surface of the entirety of the flake. This is normal optical behavior, but it's also not the behavior that we're actually interested in targeting. So like I said earlier, we're interested in areas where we have non-uniform optical behavior, where part of our flake looks brighter than the rest of our flake, or where we see different levels of activity in different areas at different wavelengths. And so again, like our previous image, we see multiple different wavelengths where most of our events are happening. However, unlike our previous flake example, the, we now see non-uniform brightness. The edges of our flake are now significantly brighter than the center at 650 nanometers, and the center is now brighter at 530 and 450 nanometers. What you'll notice as compared to our previous slide is that we were initially looking at only a single flake, whereas now we're looking at a cluster of flakes. Uh, we targeted clusters of flakes because we were interested in seeing with the possibility of multiple flakes overlapping if the difference of a single layer of material versus a multiple layers of overlapping material might cause non-uniform optical activity. So when we saw that in the difference between single and multiple flakes, we potentially thought that that was the cause, that we had multiple flakes overlapping and that's what was causing this non-uniform cathodoluminescence activity. However, Further studies showed that for individual flakes, in this case, an individual flake of tungsten sulfide selenide, we also began to see this kind of increased brightness at about 650 nanometers along the very edge of the flake as opposed to the center of the flake. So that told us that this behavior was not exclusively limited, it limited to clusters of flakes and that a bilayer was most likely not the only cause of this behavior. However, what you'll also notice is that our two previous examples of non-uniform activity have both been of tungsten sulfide selenide. Did we observe it for other materials? In this case, yes. Uh, we also saw uh, multiple examples of different materials, which I've chosen to represent here with a tungsten disulfide sample that have, I'm not sure how well you can see it with the contrast of the screen, but we, but we again still see Increased activity at about 665 nanometers for this material um, at the edges of the flake as compared to the center of the flake. We're still seeing that kind of non-uniform behavior that we're interested in. 
When we actually stopped to attempt to break down this behavior and quantify it and, and better analyze it and try to establish its source, our analysis began to run into some significant issues. Um, we used uh, two different uh, image breakdown decomposition methods to accomplish this analysis known as principal component analysis and non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, both are techniques that kind of fall outside of the scope of this talk to give full explanations of, but essentially all you need to know is that both are designed to take our data set, which as we talked about is a whole host of different images spread across a bunch of different wavelengths, and try to pick out the most significant or prominent features of these images. So the areas that had the greatest difference in brightness or areas where there was high brightness in general, the idea was that this, these algorithms would be able to split our large series of images into only the points that show the kind of activity we're interested in studying. You'll notice that this uh, represents a fairly good uh, attempt at image e decomposition. The components one, th one through three match up fairly well with the differences in brightness that we saw above. However, there are still a number of drawbacks, even to this, well, this uh, optimal example of an image decomposition. You'll notice that in our spectral results, we see a lot of tiny little peaks and valleys, which indicates a lot of signal or noise as opposed to proper signal uh, from our image decomposition. Ideally, if our analysis methods are working optimally, we would want that to be a very smooth curve. Uh, you'll also notice that components four and five have these very, very high peaks but only in a very, very narrow uh, subset of the data range. And you'll notice in the abundance maps that those are actually just individual bright pixels. So that clearly skews our analysis and wasn't really representative of anything that we saw in the actual raw data. This got worse for any of our images that had more subtle differences in brightness. You'll notice that for our, our abundance maps, we no longer see like very distinct areas of brightness. The background and the flake themselves start to blend together. And we still see in the latter components four and five areas where we have these individual bright pixels that are just starting to skew our analysis. In conclusion, uh, we still need to continue to revisit and uh, work more on our image analysis methodologies. Uh, there are a number, of, a number of possible causes for the image artifacts that we saw. Uh, Individual bright pixels could be caused by cosmic ray interference, whereas the more significant and broader differences in image brightness uh, could have been caused by poor centering of our flake with respect to our little 10 nanometer window of acquisition. If that flake was not in the exact center of that window, our, as our electron beam would raster or go line by line over the surface of our material, the closer it got to the edge of that image, the less well aligned that would become with our spectrometer that collects our light. So the edges of our image would look darker than they should in reality. And that would cause our analysis methodologies to pick out that as the most significant changes in brightness and miss some of the more subtle differences that we were interested in targeting. Uh, so once. Once we were to revisit our analysis methodologies and find a better strategy to kind of normalize our brightness to try and get rid of these artifacts by smoothing over er uh, erratic differences in brightness for our images, we uh, would hope to be able to take further data and confirm some of the initial trends that we saw. Uh, in terms of future questions, uh, in addition to revising our analysis methodologies, there is also uh, very interesting possibilities when it comes to taking transmission electron microscopy images of our flakes, uh, which could directly show some of the structural uh, features of the material. You can directly see how the crystalline matrix is arranged, which could help us to identify what it was exactly that was causing this non-uniform brightness. Uh, additionally, several other researchers led by Dr. Shoujun Zheng have found that by sandwiching the materials we were studying in between layers of another 2D nanostructure known as hexagonal boron nitride, we were able to greatly increase the brightness of the, the peak brightness uh, exhibited by cathodoluminescence. And just testing their findings and seeing if they held true for our results would pose an interesting question for study. Uh, here are all of the works that I cited as part of my discussion. And once again, I'd like to thank the Department of Energy, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Dr. Benjamin Lowry, the rest of my research group, 
and all of the Bellarmine faculty who helped me to develop this talk into what it was today. has excelled in the classroom and on the field uh, for Zinnia as a member of our women's uh, soccer team uh, here at Bellarmine. Uh, she is currently working for DMLO CPAs uh, here in Louisville, Kentucky. And after graduation, she is weighing her options uh, for careers uh, related to mathematics, uh, perhaps in finance, data analytics, uh, accounting, wherever her uh, brilliant mind uh, takes her next. She is going to be presenting today uh, on the uh, global uh, positioning uh, system. So uh, everybody, big hand for Xenia. Thank you. So I'm going to try and share my screen here. Um, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah, great. OK. Woo. And you guys can see? Yeah, yes. OK, sorry. I can't really see from over here. All right. So my name is Xenia Nava. Um, and first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to be able to present this way uh, for your flexibility that I'm very, very appreciative of. So I decided to do my thesis on the global positioning system. So first off, when you hear global positioning system, or what do you think of? So when asking fellow classmates, it's incredible the things that they said. One of my roommates said it sounded like a professional machine, while one of my other roommates said it was some contraption used all around the world. Although they were both technically right, they didn't even know to realize that it was simply the GPS and that that's what it stood for. Uh, the fact that so many people use it often and we heavily depend on it yeah, we don't even know that that's what those letters uh, stand for was uh, bizarre to me. So because of how heavily dependent we are, uh, I decided to research how it worked. And um, through the research, I realized there was math behind it. And um, being a math major, I was just very excited to see how all that worked. And I wanted to see it to dig further and see its contribution to the world, uh, as well as um, the future and what it may come with it. So. A little background before I get into the math. I wanted to share just how dependent we're all we are all on the GPS and all the cool applications it's being used for all around the world. So in 2019, it was estimated that the GPS was used worldwide by 6.8 billion devices, uh, and I can't begin to imagine what that number was as of 2022, also post COVID. So the GPS has been known for being one of the biggest influential systems to impact the world. It's useful to military bases all around the world and has changed the nature of weapon targeting, command and control, guidance of unnamed manned systems, and supply delivery uh, to the battlefield, which has been a really big one. It's also allowed many businesses to thrive, uh, such as Uber, DoorDash, uh, et cetera. Um, and it's especially during COVID-19, it was very helpful uh, when needed to deliver uh, some people's medicine or other urgent supplies that they may have needed. Um, another important thing that the GPS has done, it has increased safety. I'm sure we're all familiar with Life360 accident support or even uh, Google CarPlay that most of our cars have. Um, and that's been very helpful for anyone that needs to be able to get, a, get our location and pinpoint where we are. Uh, it has also been very useful to marine navigation, farming and plowing, logistic companies, and so much more. Um, and I just think it's amazing how many things that this uh, small technology has been able to provide us with. And there's also some really, really cool uh, future projects, but I'll get into that later. So before we begin, a little background to the GPS. Uh, determining how to navigate locations before the GPS was done simply through, as we all know, known points in the sky. The stars long ago, uh, ancient sailors would look into the sky and try to find their ways through constellation. Today, all people need is a simple electronic device with a GPS receiver to figure out what exact route it is that they need to take. So Dr. Gladys West was the first person to discover and invent this system. Uh, being a black woman in the 
1960s uh, posed challenges for her to create the scientific workforce um, or to enter the scientific workforce for her, um, but she was able to break through those barriers. So I think it's important to give credit where it's due. Uh, it was originally created um, for the US military that bought it from her in the 1960s. And then today, like I said, it's useful in military, weather conditions, vehicle location, farms, mapping, and just so many other um, areas that it's very useful in. So to explain what a GPS is in the simplest forms, um, it's overall made up of three parts. Uh, those three parts include satellites, ground stations, and receivers. Uh, to define each, the satellites, um, there's four total uh, when we're trying to pinpoint an exact location. And those, uh, they act like stars and constellations that we know where they are at a given time. So next, the ground stations. They are using radar to track those satellites to ensure that the satellites are actually where we may think they are. And then lastly, the receiver, uh, it's looking for the signal that these satellites are sending out. Uh, this receiver could be a phone or a part of a vehicle, um, anything that we're familiar with. And one of the receivers attains this signal and it figure out, figures out how far away uh, a person or an object may be. But it can do other things as well such as determine the time it may take for you to get to those uh, pinpoints based on your speed. And it's important to remember that it's working through four satellites. Um, that'll be important as we get into the more math uh, background to it. So the GPS receiver can display our position on Earth at any location in time using simple algebra. So to explain this, we must understand the design. Uh, we use a design of 31 satellites. Um, the picture you're seeing is not that design. Um, the picture you're seeing is an example of the original goal. And that was to have each of the six uh, total orbits evenly divided every 60 degrees around the Earth. Uh, the orbits would be sitting on planes that would be inclined 55 degrees uh, from the Earth's equator. So the image of the satellites around the Earth kind of gives us an idea of how we're completely surrounded by these orbits, making it you know, possible for these satellites to determine our location on Earth, uh, no matter, you know, where we are. And obviously there's, you can sort of see these three um, different sets. There's six on each. So that makes a total 18, 18 satellites. And um, that was the just original design. And I thought it was very important to see that uh, before we can get into the next part. So now that we have the design down, um, I'll go into the main mathematical method behind the system, um, and it's based on a mathematical process called three-dimensional trilateration. So trilateration is defined as a type of measurement uh, used to determine the location of a point by using geometry of spheres, circles, or triangles, or anything else. So before discussing the process it uses, um, it's important to first know how two-dimensional trilateration works, uh, which simply uses a circle shape to locate an object somewhere. And I thought it would be very important to give you an example um, before we can get into the actual 3D. Um, so here's a simple example. So suppose that you're told that there's an imaginary basketball on a court and your goal is to be able to find exactly where this imaginary ball is placed. So the first clue that you're given is that the ball is located 10 meters from the hoop. So the hoop, as we all know, is on the edge of a basketball court and it's 10 meters from the hoop. So this could be anywhere along this green circle that's shown here. So moving forward, now that you can see where this ball could be located, the second clue that we're given is that the imaginary basketball is located 30 meters from point A. So we can see in this diagram that point A is located in the bottom left corner of the rectangle, which again is like the basketball court. So since we know this, we're able to draw a line out from point A and draw an arc of where this ball could be. So doing this allows us to see that the imaginary ball could be located at two different points that we created. So now moving forward, now that we can visualize where these two points are, the third and final clue that we're given is that the imaginary basketball is located 25 meters from point B. This point B is located at the top left corner of the rectangle, uh, again, the basketball court. This final clue simplifies things a lot as we can now determine which point of those two is needed. We would simply just need to create another arc um, as we can see in this figure. And it's very easy to determine where the intersection point is and where that imaginary ball is located. For us, it's this orange colored circle on my drawing. 
Um, this orange circle is where those arcs are meeting um, and where the imaginary ball is. And that's basically just a simple example of how 2D or two-dimensional trilateration works. So now we move forward to 3D trilateration. Um, and it's this is exactly what the GPS is doing. And now that we kind of have an idea of 2D, um, here's an example of how the 3D works. So, and again, so let's, uh, here's an example. So clue one, you suppose that the distance that is calculated was 20 kilometers. So in this figure, the receiver could be in any direction from the green sphere, which that would be our satellite one. Like I mentioned before, there's going to be four total satellites that we um, include. So the green sphere is satellite one. And we know that because it's located, it has a radius of 20 kilometers. And obviously the earth here is located in blue. So moving forward, now that we see how satellite one is involved, we can now bring in satellite two. So this satellite sends in yet another signal to the receiver. Um, and we'll then do the same things to like calculate the distance from that satellite to the receiver. So once the distance is calculated from the receiver, we can see that the satellite one and satellite two spheres overlap um, as we're doing the same thing kind of that we did in 2D trilateration. So the space in which they overlap forms a circle as shown here. So moving forward here, uh, from seeing this picture, we can see that the object could be anywhere along the circle where the spheres overlap. So now that we move forward to this, um, the same things is going to happen with the last two satellites. Satellite three and four, they're both going to send a signal as well to the receiver, and then it'll calculate the distance once again. Incorporating satellite three signal, we notice that the spheres are all going to overlap at two perfect points. From these points, we know that there are two possible places where this object could be. And finally, the only thing that's left is that fourth satellite to, this, the, to determine which of those two intersection points is the location of the object. So doing the same process in which we bring in the satellite four, we see that there's only one point where all of these four satellites meet. And we can see that here on this uh, red circle here. So that would be where our location would be technically on Earth. So as we have seen, this is an example of 3D trilateration and how it allows for the global positioning system to really pinpoint an exact position of an object. Um, it clearly shows where the four satellites navigating on object, an object on Earth um, to clearly illustrate the positioning. Uh, so that's the basic math that's behind it. And I could go into much more math involved, including how the actual calculation of longitude, latitude, altitude, uh, which we use the formula distance for. So the formula distance is D equals VT, where D is the distance. V is the velocity, T is the time. So knowing all of this, it's crucial to note that at a certain time during the day, the satellite and the GPS receiver, they're go both going to emit uh, this um, identical pseudo random code. So whenever a person turns on their GPS signal, it'll automatically start receiving the code um, that the signal is emitting. And the signal emits this through a wave from the satellite to the Earth that will then give us our location. So here is um, a more clear photo for those of you that don't like just circles and lines um, <laughs> to show you how everything is placed. So here's the four satellites and we can see the GPS receiver um, and then Earth is this green part on the bottom. And we can really see how that's working. Um, so I go more heavily in the math behind finding that exact altitude, uh, longitude and um, uh, things on our, um, as well as discussing the code um, more in actual, in my actual written thesis, but for time purposes, I cut those out of my presentation, but you're, if you're interested, I would be more than happy to share the paper with you. Um, but to conclude on the math section, the GPS actually begins with a simple mathematical process, but it can become very challenging as we dig deeper and we now can see this in within the 3D trilateration. So with the reliance of the three dimensions, as well as the four different satellites, we can prove more, provide more information to any single object or pinpoint any location. All right. So moving away from all the heavy math um, and the algebra, one of the most interesting aspects of the GPS is that I can create so many different types of routes for a person to locate an object um, or place. So one of the main ways that the system does this is through route optimization. So as defined here, the pro it's the process of finding the most cost efficient route for a set of stops. It minimizes driving time and mileage stops, and it takes into consideration the number of cars on the road, 
the number of stops on the route, number of objects that are in the way, et cetera. So Google Maps Route Planner is actually one of the most widely used applications when it comes to route optimization. It finds the latitude and longitude coordinates of the, of the two points between which we're trying to, to travel. So each of these points, let's just say point A and point B, they're pinned onto the map. And then from that, once they're pinned onto the map, from that, um, every single possible route between those two points is going to be attained. Whether that's around a building, through a building, or anything else you can think of, every single route from those two points is going to be navigated within um, the distance between them. So from that point, Google will basically score each of the routes and it will minimize them uh, depending on the traffic time, uh, depending on conditions, distance, anything else you can think of. Um, and whichever one, it'll come up with about two or three, as we can see on our phone, it does that, you know, we're not given all the different routes, we're just giving the two or three best ones, because that's the process of Google basically scoring which one um, the system thinks is going to be best for us. And um, that differs whether that's, do you want to get to a place um, faster, but use more mileage? Or do you want to save on gas and get to a place longer, but it's actually going to end up uh, using less mileage. So I think that's really interesting and something that the GPS can do as well. So again, it's very, very important to realize um, that the map on our phone is doing all of this within a matter of seconds, which is crazy how this uh, form of technology um, is actually working. So moving forward, um, another thing that the GPS really uh, relies heavily on is decision theory. So it's going to use decision theory to determine the best routes by taking into consideration all the different outcomes that may occur. The GPS is heavily involved in the normative theory branch of decision theory um, as we are focusing on obtaining an optimal route. And that's how it kind of falls under this normative theory branch. Um, through this, it'll use method methodologies and softwares to just make the most accurate decision in which, you know, tra travel route to take. So for example, when we change our path that the GPS has not provided us with, it must enter this recalculation stage. And I'm sure we've all done this. Uh, I've done this a lot when I take a wrong turn or I try to ignore my GPS and go the wrong way. Uh, it'll completely just stop and it'll just say this whole, you know, recalculation stage. And um, when it does this, uh, we're left with a waiting period in which the GPS is using this uh, specific decision theory to decide um, where to go from there. And I think it's really cool that uh, even if we don't have, you know, signal or anything, it could still recalculate all the different routes um, you can take. So again, that makes a lot of us very heavily dependent. Um, so to think of a better way to see decision theory and how it's used in the GPS system, we can think of nodes and connections. As we can see in this figure, uh, we can see the nodes, those are the filled in circles, and then the edges, those are the lines connecting um, those nodes. So these suggest the possible driving paths from one location to another. Uh, the optimum path can be used by minimizing our time or our mileage. And at each node, uh, we can also think of like a street corner. Uh, we're able to choose how to continue on our path. So if we're on a street corner, also known as a node. We can decide if we want to keep going straight or do we want to take a right to avoid whatever's in front of us. And as we can see clearly in this picture, um, while some of these lines are definitely longer, uh, for example, the five minute and the 10 minute connected by the node, the 10 minute is clearly less distance since the line is smaller, but again, it's taking you longer. Whereas the five minute, it's gonna be faster, but it's a longer distance to cover. So again, a lot of things could be going into this. It could be, you know, is there traffic? Is there a stop sign? Is there a stoplight? So again, I think it's really cool that it gives us this um, idea to, to realize which which path it is that we we want to continue down. So, like I said, I was going to explain the GPS and the many future projects that it uh, has. The space case is a interesting one for terrestrial navigation. It's basically a case where we're transforming the GPS to be able to send signals to and from Mars. Um, this has allowed for much investigation of of life outside of Earth. Another one is the nationwide communication project. We're trying to get signals developed for positioning satellites from the U.S. to other countries, for example, Europe, uh, China, Japan, so that they're all um, interoperable for use in space. Um, another one is NASA's tracking stations. Um, they're trying to make it 
act on the satellites and just create more modern styles to these machines just to make them more efficient. Um, always trying to improve. And then a very interesting thing that I found recently was NASA's uh, project. They actually crashed a spacecraft into an asteroid, which I thought was really cool. Very movie uh, style, but it's uh, real life. Um, and they wanted to see if they could alter the route that this asteroid was taking. And uh, they had to use a lot of math uh, to decipher where exactly they wanted to put this spacecraft, uh, what part they were going to, you know, uh, crash into the asteroid. And again, we won't know for a long time, but just the idea of using the math and the GPS in a way to realize where this asteroid's going, um, the positioning, the location and all that. Um, it was just something that was really, really interesting to me. So overall, the GPS continues to be a very prominent part of the world. Um, through doing this research, I was able to discover that the system is based on somewhat simple and basic algebra. Uh, being such a complex piece of technology, it's crazy to realize that it only revolves on the foundation of you know, 3D trilateration. Um, again, there's more math involved to it, but that is the main um, mathematical process that it depends on. And it's exciting to me to know that this one small machine has already done so much for the entire world. And I wanted to leave you with a basic understanding to the system that we're all very heavily dependent on. It's important. It was very important to me to discover um, how it worked. And then before I finish, I'd like to thank Dr. Raymond and Dr. White, both from the math department who helped me extensively in the writing and creating of this uh, thesis around with being very, very flexible with me. Um, I'm very, very thankful for all of their help and feedback that they provided with me with. And then these are my resources and citations that I used. And, you know, once again, I hope I left, left you with a better understanding of what the GPS is. And thank you for letting me present to you. everyone. Uh, as Dr. Blanford said, I'm Kenny Kelly. I'm a clinical psychology and visual art double major with an emphasis in painting, and I'm going to be presenting on my project titled The Hurt and the Healing, an Artistic Investigation into the uh, Stigma Surrounding Substance Use Disorder. Before I begin, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this evening and listening to all of our presentations. It truly is an honor to present on a topic that I'm passionate about to a group of people who are interested in listening. I'd also like to thank my thesis advisor, Professor Hartford, and my thesis readers, Dr. Pam Carter and Professor Sarah Martin, for all their help during this process. And finally, I'd like to thank the National Collegiate Honors Council for awarding me with the Ports Interdisciplinary Fellowship, which allowed me to uh, develop my project to the full extent that I had hoped. 
To begin, I'd like to provide you all with some background as to how I got interested in this topic. Back in high school, I was introduced to an organization called, called Art for All People in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I quickly started volunteering alongside the founder, Sarah Hellman. Art for All People's mission is to reach out to marginalized communities to provide them with the means to create art. It is Sarah Hellman's belief that art can provide a special kind of healing that may be particularly hard to achieve through the other means such as verbal expression. Therefore, it is Art for All People's goal to help people achieve healing through the artistic process and tr trusting relationships formed during the art sessions. During the three years that I spent volunteering with Art for All People, I visited women's shelters, children's homes, and I even led independent painting sh sessions with children at the Welcome House of Cincinnati. However, my favorite uh, place to volunteer at during my time with Art for All People was the Center for Addictions Treatment, or CAT as we called it. Now, I have to admit something to you all. I was originally nervous going into this experience because of the preconceptions I had about substance use and those who struggled with it. Prior to my first visit to CAT, my only exposure to these topics came from what I had observed on TV shows and movies or in the news. As all of you probably have observed for yourselves, these portrayals of substance use and those who struggle with it in these forms of media are oftentimes less than sympathetic, and they often only frame the person using substances as being criminal, irresponsible, a junkie, or even just straight up a bad person. Even in shows like Breaking Bad, where you can see some of the realistic portrayals of substance use, or at least its effects in people's lives, these difficult topics are still glamorized in a way that ignores the full reality of the issue, or at least they make it seem more digestible. However, this is far from the reality that I observed when volunteering at my first session at CAT. During the course of our two and a half hour session, Sarah guided the group at CAT step by step through a painting, and I went around the room and provided any help when it was needed. Sometimes I would help someone if they needed assistance painting or drawing a straight line. Some people wanted to execute their own design instead of painting the one that Sarah was uh, guiding them through. And so I would talk them through their idea and help them sketch it out onto the canvas. No matter what I was doing, I was sitting down and talking with people as I helped them with their artwork. As I talked to them, I heard about their lives. I heard about their children, their parents, their, where they worked or used to hold a job, what hobbies they had, what their favorite food was, and how their day had been. What I came to realize through these, what would seem to be completely normal conversations, was a revelation that stuck with me and grew stronger every single day that I continued to volunteer with Sarah at CAD. There was absolutely no reason that I should have been nervous going into my first session volunteering at CAT. After all, these people were just that. They were people. No different from you or me. They had lives they led and passions they wanted to pursue and painful memories and regrets. The only difference between them and me was that their particular struggle was one that has been heavily stigmatized and misunderstood in our country for a very long time now. The same stigma and misinformation is what contributed to creating the TV shows that I saw that in turn made me uncomfortable with the idea of interacting or being around people who struggled with substance use disorder. The more I volunteered with Art for All People and the more I got interested in this topic, the more I began to notice manifestations of substance use disorder stigma within different aspects of our society. To me, this topic, uh, <laughs> to me, this topic is so pervasive and quite frankly disturbing that I felt compelled to pursue this topic further with my honors thesis. Before I go into the actual project that I created, I think it would be useful to present some data and information regarding substance use disorder and its accompanying stigma. To begin, substance use disorder is defined as a mental health disorder which affects the physiology of the brain and influences a person's behavior. It also involves varying degrees of use of alcohol, controlled substances, illicit drugs, etc., ranging from moderate to excessive use. Oftentimes, because of the physiological changes that occur to the brain over extended periods of use, a person is unable to control their urges to use the substance of their choice, and therefore they may end up behaving in ways that negatively impact their day-to-day -day life and relationships. Other mental health disorders are often comorbid with substance use disorder, meaning that an individual with substance use disorder will often also struggle with other mental health disorders, such as depression, anxiety, and even schizophrenia. According to a report published by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, 20.4 million people in the United States were diagnosed with substance use disorder within the past year. 
Of those diagnosed with substance use disorder, only 10.3% of, uh, of those people receive substance use disorder treatment. Some of the barriers to treatment that have been cited include cost of treatment, geographic location, co-occurring uh, co disorder treatment availability, and maybe unsurprisingly due to the uh, topic of my project, stigma. This data is even more concerning given the additional statistic that nearly 71,000 people died of drug overdoses in 2019 alone. Now, I know this is a number from a couple of years ago, but given the events of the past two years and conversations that I've had with mental health professionals about substance use disorder in relation to the events taking place in the past two years, it is a safe bet that these numbers have more than likely not come down. If anything, it seems more than likely that they've increased. Since stress, personal and societal instability and environmental strain are some of the factors that contribute to people developing and to continuing to suffer with a substance use disorder. Ooh, fun. Another factor that contributes to our country's continued struggle with substance use disorder is stigma. Stigma quite literally means a mark of disdain or discredit or stain. Considering this definition alone, it's easy to see why someone would struggle if they were stigmatized. However, research does provide us with clear evidence of this. According to the American Psychological Association, stigma has de demonstrated to increase personal sh shame, hopelessness, mental health issues, and isolation on an individual level. It also reduces self-esteem and self-efficacy, otherwise known as a person's belief in their capacity to execute behaviors specific to performance attainments. Stigma also greatly reduces the likelihood of someone asking for help since the individual worries about how the people perceive them and, as a result, how they will be treated. This is especially true for those who struggle with substance use disorder, since substance use has long been regarded as an issue of personal and moral responsibility rather than a health condition. There are three distinct types of stigma that are discussed within the research. Structural, public, and self-stigma. Structural, or institutional stigma, is the societal behaviors that create and perpetuate prejudice and discrimination. As such, it includes policies of governments and private organizations that intentionally or unintentionally limit opportunities for those who struggle with substance use disorder. Examples of this include receiving poor medical care because of substance use, being denied a job opportunity due to history of substance use, or legislation such as mandatory minimum drug sentences. Public stigma, on the other hand, are the negative attitudes held by the general public and attitudes of subgroups, including first responders, clergy, etc. Part of the reason why public st stigma persists is because of the legislation and policies that come as a result of structural stigma, which appear to endorse and promote discriminatory attitudes towards certain populations. These policies guide behavior for citizens and often help inform the decisions they make and opinions they form about certain populations. Finally, the last piece of the puzzle is self-stigma. Self-stigma refers to the negative attitudes, including internalized shame that people have about their own condition. This type often comes as a result of an individual facing structural and public stigma, which leads them to internalize these negative attitudes and apply it directly to themselves. The internal narrative of someone who holds self-stigma can sound a lot like, I'm dangerous, I'm incompetent, I'm to blame which leads to an intensified feeling of hopelessness and lowered self-esteem and self-efficacy. Low self-efficacy has been associated with failure to pursue work or independent living, and it also been, has been shown to negatively correlate with help-seeking behavior. Considering all this, it becomes clear that stigma is a monumental barrier to people overcoming substance use disorder and trying to achieve uh, treatment. Even more so, it is something that we can all choose whether or not to take part in. This choice, however, comes with some caveats. Substance use disorder is something that has been peddled to us as American citizens for the past 50 years, and primarily since the inception of the war on drugs and the legislation and policies that came forth from it, namely the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 and mandatory minimum drug sentences. The narrative that was pushed during this time and that continues to be pushed to this very day is that people who freely choose to use drugs are dangerous criminals who wish ill will on us and our very society as we know it. It is a narrative that is fueled by misinformation and more potently, fear. Ultimately, I think this is all that stigma really is at the end of the day. It's fear that comes from misunderstanding. Fear is not something to be trifled with. 
It's an incredibly powerful emotion that can motivate people to do things and act in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. However, fear is also not something that can't be de deconstructed and replaced. By taking the misinformation about substance use disorder that has been promoted for the past several decades and replacing it with actual research about substance use disorder and what we can do to help prevent and treat it, along with encouraging people to get involved and create a community with people who struggle, I believe we can start the process of deconstructing stigma and replacing it with an equally powerful force, that being empathy. It all starts with something that can start a conversation or something that evokes human emotions just as strong as stigma and fear. So this is why I chose to pursue an interdisciplinary thesis project, one which would combine the objective research about substance use disorder and stigma with the powerful medium of art. One of the things, first things I did during my research and artistic process was research some, art, some artists that, to inspire me along the way. I was primarily drawn to the work of Eva Hess, which you see over on the very left-hand side, a German-American artist who is best known for her work creating large found object sculptures. I particularly loved how she was able to take inorganic materials and use and display them in a way that make them look like organic forms. In addition to Hesse, I also admired the work of Nam June Pike, who you see right here. Uh, Nam June Pike is a Japanese American artist who is widely considered the father, father of video art. He created fascinating installations, like the one you see here, uh, using televisions and screens. And his work often revolved around themes of futurism, technological advancement, and interaction between humans and technology. I also drew inspiration from John Baldessari, who you can see right down there in the center. Uh, <laughs> I particularly fell in love with his work, which you see next to him, titled, What is Painting? Oftentimes with his work, Baldessari likes to challenge the audience on their notions of what they believe art to be, or how they believe art should look like, or how it should function. Lastly, I took inspiration from Yoko Ono, and primarily her project titled The Wishing Tree, which you also see pictured here, in which she asks the audience to participate by writing their hopes, wishes, and dreams on a piece of paper and tying that paper to a branch on a tree. I love this idea of audience participation and engagement because it really allows the artwork to come alive and it allows the audience to feel as though they had a hand in creating the artwork, which isn't often something that audience members to artwork get the chance to do. In addition to these artists, I was also inspired by something that you all may have actually seen out and about in your daily lives, but didn't even know it. I didn't know it at first when I first saw these. These little guys are the cocoon of the bagworm moth. Different species of bagworm moths are found around the world. However, we tend to find this specific guy on the right-hand side uh, in our region uh, and in the East Coast. Bagworms create their cocoons during their larval stages, where they spin and cover them with plant material that's plenty plentiful and readily available in their environment, such as pine needles and sticks. As a result, the cocoons have a lot of texture and give the experience of the appearance of being spiky or hairy. The reason why I chose the bagworm in its cocoon as inspiration for my work is because I felt the process they used to create their cocoons was similar to the experience of those who are stigmatized because of their struggle with substance use disorder. Like bagworms, people often construct their personal environment based on what they are surrounded by. If their external environment is rife with stigma, that will shape their personal world as well. Stigma creates an imprisoning cocoon, one that never opens or permits transformation, which is especially harmful for those who struggle with substance use disorder. Finally, the last piece of the puzzle in terms of inspiration for my artwork came from interviews I conducted with members of the substance use recovery community who graciously shared their personal hi history and experiences with substance use disorder, as well as their thoughts and feelings regarding stigma. So, now that I've talked about all the research that I've done for this project, I guess it would make sense to actually show you pictures of the artwork that I created and talk about it. So to begin, I, know that I, wanted, I knew that I wanted to create an installation sculpture piece. While I'm mainly a painter, I uh, took an interest in installation work after taking an art concepts course here at Bellarmine. What I love in particular about installation work is that it allows the audience to exist in a space alongside the work, which I believe makes the artwork that much more engaging. 
In addition, I also knew that I wanted my installation sculptures to be in a large scale because I, thought, I felt as though this would make the pieces more impactful. There we go. <laughs> After approaching how to create my sculptures from several different directions, in the end, I decided that I would create freestanding wood armatures to form the foundation for the sculptures. After a couple of super fun trips to some department stores with my dad, I ended up getting two four by four inch wood posts, several two by threes and two by fours, and five sheets of plywood. We knew that the only way to get the sculptures into the gallery where they would finally be installed was through the one door that you see over there <laughs> leading, to the, leading into it. So we made sure that none of the wood pieces in the armature exceeded those measurements so that we would be able to fit them through the door and carry them inside. We also knew that we, wanted, we had to separate each of the armatures into two sections since this would make them easier to carry, fit, and install into the gallery. While one of the armatures was composed of complete circles of plywood, pie-shaped sections were cut out of the second armature to create the opening that would be featured in the second sculpture. Yet again, I have a lot of images on this slide, so it wants to lag on me. From here, we carried the armatures down into the basement of my parents' house so the wood wouldn't warp. And I began covering them in a skin-like layer of burlap. Basically, all I did was staple the burlap in large sheets onto those armatures to create the surface in which I could apply the texture to. I also, following the tradition of Ava Hess and her found object sculptures, I went outside and gathered some natural elements, such as the wood you see on the top of the armature right here, to add some more dimension and texture like I wanted to. And once I had the skin layer on, I started slowly but surely applying strips of various materials to the outer, um, to the outer parts of the sculpture to create the texture, similar to what you see with the bagworm cocoons. The materials I used for this were more pieces of burlap, brown packing paper, some Kona quilt brown fabric, <laughs> have that memorized at this point after so many trips to Joann's. Um, <laughs> and some newspaper. Out of all these materials, the newspaper was the most intentional. What I wanted to capture with the newspaper being included in the texture of the uh, sculptures was how newspaper media has contributed to spreading substance use disorder stigma, in addition to television media, which you will also see featured in the gallery. In addition to these installation sculpture pieces, I thought it was also necessary to create other pieces that would contextualize the work since I realized that a lot of my work is pretty symbolic and metaphorical. And so following the tradition of John Baldessari, I created these um, uh, t-shirts and business casual shirts and what have you <laughs> by basically just taking the definition of stigma, printing it out, tracing it onto this piece of cardboard, cutting out the letters, and then spray painting onto the t-shirts. The idea of this was originally to have it as a wall hanging installation piece alongside the sculptures, but I've decided at this point that I would rather give them out uh, to members of the audience to kind of symbolize how society creates stigma and forces people to wear it around with them every day. In addition, there is another wall hanging installations piece that is actually installed uh, and won't be given out, but you can participate in. So this installation piece is again, taking inspiration from John Baldessari, where I clearly just uh, lay out the definition of empathy, at least Brene Brown's definition of empathy. What I particularly love about this definition is that it's operational. It gives us the clear actions and behaviors that are necessary in order to perform proper empathy and really commune with someone else and reassure them that they're not alone. For this piece, I encourage everyone to, if they are comfortable and want to, there is a stand in front of these envelopes in the gallery and you are welcome to write on the pieces of paper that are on the stand and insert those pieces of paper into the envelopes. These can be messages, anonymous messages to people who are struggling, 
maybe retelling how you personally have been affected by substance use disorder. All in all, the point of this is to get a conversation going and get and start a community of people who aren't afraid to talk about this issue because ultimately nothing gets done if we don't talk about it. The final piece of the gallery and what I feel is the most important are the artistic contributions that I gathered from those in the substance use recovery community. I was inspired to do this by a book that I'm reading uh, called Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration by Nicole R. Fleetwood. In this book, she talks about how um, she curates artwork from incarcerated uh, communities and puts them on show in galleries. I thought this was incredibly powerful because often these populations don't get the opportunity to display their art. Usually their art is discarded before they even manage to get out of the prison system. And so in order to properly portray the voices and the stories of those who struggle with substance use disorder, I felt that I should include artwork actually created by that community. It's great and wonderful if I'm going out and creating work, but I think ultimately their voices are what matter the most. And so I reached out again to Sarah Hellman from Art for All People and asked her if I could volunteer with her over the summer to gather some artwork from members of the substance use recovery community. Eventually, I joined her for three different painting sessions at Crossroads Recovery Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And during those three painting sessions, I gathered a total of 16 works created by women at Crossroads. What I found particularly interesting about this is when I presented my project and also prompts to go along and inspire their work if they had trouble coming up with ideas, those prompts dealt with both substance use, with all of the above, substance use disorder, stigma, recovery, and empathy. However, given the choice, every single woman in there decided to focus on hope and recovery and healing. What I find particularly powerful about this is that given everything that these women have gone through, they still have hope for their own futures. So why can't we? Why can't we also encourage them and help them along the way? Oh, to conclude, I am, in, as you can tell, insanely passionate about this. And I hope that my gallery show can be an impetus for conversation and can get people more comfortable about talking about this issue and going out and interacting with those, even people that they don't know um, who are struggling. Ultimately, this is the only way that we're going to get, achieve any sort of change. And like I said, we have a choice in this matter. There's a lot to do with this issue that we don't have control over. This is one that we do. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. I'd like to thank, again, Dr. Hartford and all my, re uh, my readers for helping me with this long, long process of doing this project. And I hope you all enjoy my gallery. So.
Is she gonna be on screen? No, she's not. This one is like that. Alright, boo. And leave your photos in the floor You know, while I'm doing this, can we have a big hand for all of our people? Yesterday, and I was like, oh, she's out. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I was like, reading's gonna be better. Yes, dude, just like having a script. I know I read a lot. Yeah. Sorry, technical difficulties. Again, just downloaded Microsoft Teams today. I never even heard of it before. <laughs> Even if there we go. Knock it out of the park. You know what I'm talking about. All right, can she? Zinnia, can you hear us? We're doing a Q and A. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Oh. okay. That's our first. That's our first question. And you're welcome to turn your camera back on too. You like? Oh, can you guys see me? Yes. Yes. Yay. 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 All right. Uh, any questions from the audience from our our four? Uh, very talented and, and wonderful uh, presenters. Dr. Shmiliotis. So, Zinnia, I have a question about the GPS. How do you account for when it makes mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> Zinnia, the question is, Dr. Spiliotis's GPS occasionally makes mistakes. She wants to know why. <laughs> um, I actually don't have an answer to that question. Hey. We all make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> we all make mistakes. Uh, Professor Hartford, who never makes mistakes, does have a question. Cindy, have you, as part of your research, did you look into the sort of ethical questions about uh, data mining, uh, geographic location information? Yeah, I, Zinnia, the question was, as part of your research, did you look into any of the ethical implications related to data uh, mining and geographic location information? Or even just data access. Or even data access. In other words, uh, are there ethical dimensions to what our GPS knows about us? No, but that is really interesting and probably something that I want to look into. I didn't really think about that. Um, obviously, like it knows all the geographical locations, um, because of where they're like placed and like the satellites that are obviously like can see us right now, but um, I didn't think of the ethical part, which is something really um, interesting that I'll have to look into. I, I'd like to recommend a website called uh, I Know Where Your Cat Lives. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Zinnia, do you have a cat? No, but I really want one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Uh, uh, other questions? For, for our presenters? Dr. Spiliotis, again, with the question. So, Chloe, I, um, I think what the project you're working on, and I see you're going to keep working on that, uh, it's so exciting. But I know it's really complex, and you landed on that corruption had to be taken care of. But what needs to be taken care of? I mean, you mentioned electing the chief officials. But I'm wondering if there are deeper things that contribute to the corruption as well. So, oh, sorry, you heard <laughs> it. <here. laughs> Zinnia, the question that Dr. Spillis was posing for Chloe, so that you can hear us as good accessibility stuff, right? What, are there deeper things beyond that, that underlie this corruption uh, that, that, that Chloe has been investigating for you? Yes, deeper stuff. 
So like other issues besides like things that need to be uh, addressed along with corruption or just like what started corruption in the first place? Um, honestly, I, I don't really know what started it in the first place. Um, I think the reason I focus so much on corruption is because I think you know all the other issues like unhealthy business environment or the lack of jobs stems from that. Um, but I think like if you look at other other countries who have had maybe a similar past to Kenya, I think the thing that distinguishes Kenya from a country that has had a better uh, success with development is that corruption issue. So, but that is something that I should possibly look into why it became so bad in the first place. May I ask a problem? I, I'm wondering if it has something to do with how laws are understood and what role they really have. I do know that, I mean, the public doesn't really have a great understanding of like the constitution of Kenya or, or what rights they have. We have a question back here. Chloe, uh, Star, are you uh, familiar with, I know it's got kind of a bad name on you just recently, the Effective Altruism Movement? This. Um, so it's uh, it's basically this idea that we can figure out through data and map the things that will most help people. Uh, but it does that lead towards you know, some of the things that you pointed out that are, that are bad. You know, let's just give a bunch of money for, uh, uh, I think they're number one for a long time with some mosquito nets, right? Because it's mosquito, they're very low cost, you can put those out there. Hmm. But it's, it's very sort of database of just solving the problem. I wonder what you saw in terms of other ways you could measure the impact of these sorts of things that, that might do their algorithm, right? That might change what they might And we have another question back here. Uh, well, so you mentioned about some education that could be happening through understanding uh, corruption and what's going on, what rights the parents and uh, citizens have. What kind of education and technology do you think have access, access to right now? Is that kind of like that they're being aware of, may, being made aware of these laws and things like that that you mentioned? Yeah, I think right now there's really a lack of educational NGOs in Kibera. Um, in terms of education in general, like there are a lot of schools, uh, you might be surprised about how many schools are in Kibera. Um, and residents really placed a lot of emphasis on educating their children. Um, really, a lot of them are spending their last penny to try to educate their children. So it's not that that is lacking. Um, in terms of technology, you would also be surprised at how many residents have a phone. Um, so it's not the same like quality that you would have maybe in developed countries, but they do have fun with access to internet and access to apps. I, I text a lot of the residents who I you know interview like regularly. They'll like check up on me. So like that, um, you know, thankful to, to technology to be able to do that. Uh, Quick question from Kenny. After doing working normally you're a painter, right? Working on this piece, do you feel like you're gonna go back to painting or do you feel like you're gonna move towards uh, next media, your next big project. Kind of both, honestly. I mean, I really, <laughs> admittedly, didn't love painting coming into Bellarmine, but they make you choose between a sculpture emphasis and a painting <laughs> emphasis. And I was like, well, okay, I've never experienced anything with sculpture. I guess I'll do painting, even though I hate it. Um, but really came to love painting through being here at Bellarmine and actually am currently working on one of my biggest pieces on a five foot by four foot canvas. Um, so the plan is ultimately to mainly focus in painting because that's probably the most, the easiest thing to do, but I would love to continue to work in installation um, in any way that I can, so. <laughs> That's what a fascinating true confession. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then Craig, okay. and he's an incredible painter. Oh, folks, just saying. So you know. uh, Dr. Question from Dr. Smith. I'm so sorry. I mean, I, I, this is my extreme stupidity, but I was intrigued when you said that when you when you radiate uh -huh. what the, the surface, uh -huh. that then something pops out, and uh -huh. then you have something spectrometer that gathers all of uh -huh. that. Uh, how does that work? In other words, how does it sure. create the image in the right 
way? Yeah, uh, so essentially, uh, when you're scanning your electron beam across the surface of your flake, um, that light emission is kind of, you know, radial. It's from that point, it goes out in all directions. And so then at the top of our chamber, we have a parabolic mirror, kind of this very nice curved mirror that actually focuses that. If you can imagine that you have a point here and then it spreads out and then it hits the mirror and then it coalesces back to a single point and we focus that point over the actual like little tiny pinhole opening of our spectrometer. And then as far as building the image, it's just able to build like point by point uh, the actual like relative brightnesses of the light at a given wavelength. Like it has filters that select between those wavelengths and only let through that specific wavelength. And then we're able to kind of bit by bit build out an image based on that. So oh, I have a follow up. Do you sure. think that that's in any way related to how the eye sees? Um, they're similar processes. I mean, any kind of imaging is, is really just a series of um, photoreceptors that are, are basically going to, to send some kind of a signal in response to a certain brightness threshold for light. So it, in the eye, I'm, I'm no biology major, so I can't speak to that, but you know, you have your, your cone and rod cells that are designed to be you know, photoreceptive and send a, a neural impulse when you have that brightness. And the only difference when you're talking about it in computerized terms is yeah, that you're just focusing that onto a machine that, that sends an electrical signal in response to that brightness. So, yeah. Yeah, um, that, that's awesome. Uh, a lot of people ask about that. Um, so what's funny, that's totally, um, that was totally outside of my research group. So I didn't directly participate in that. But as it's been described to me, it's this uh, process called chemical vapor distillation, where, yeah, you're essentially taking a saturated solution, you're evaporating it off, and then you're condensing it back down on the plate where you want them to grow. And then because they're these uh, it's a very specific temperature and pressure that you have to use that's it's very, very sensitive. But um, from that, you basically just kind of crystallize it out from, from a point like very, very fine, very tiny rock candy where, where you're, you're kind of starting from that little seed and then it builds from that same kind of crystalline matrix. They grow in these really pretty geometric patterns. It's very nice. Dr. Ackerman. So you mentioned digital applications for technology. Uh-huh. Well, it depends largely on the um, on what exactly you're uh, you're you're working with. Like I said, the whole advantage uh, why people are so interested in graphene is because it's just carbon and it's very easy to source carbon and to deposit carbon. In terms of actual manufacture, uh, when you compare it like at scale to other uh, processes, it's not nearly as expensive as the precision would make you think. It is pretty. It does scale up pretty well to my understanding. I haven't looked a lot into the economics of it, but it's it's fairly feasible. It's really just kind of doing the legwork now and kind of establishing this basis for how do these materials behave in all of these circumstances and, and kind of just building that portfolio of, of learning. How can we exploit these natural properties in, in these materials in an efficient kind of way? I think we have time for one more, one more question. I have one for Xenia. Xenia, we have a question for you. Yeah, but just like, where do you see GPS going in the future? Like, I guess the thing I think of now is like, before you now you can drop like a little person on Google Maps and Street Maps. And then obviously you mentioned like stuff with Mars and NASA, but where do you see it going? Like, I guess more like here on Earth. The question is, what is the future of GPS here on Earth? Uh, where do you see it going next? You mentioned destroying asteroids or something, but what are the future applications here uh, on our planet, Xenia? Yeah, so I think, like, aside from the, like, major projects, obviously the, the GPS is going to be able to, like, work faster and more efficient. Um, right now, it can work on three satellites. It, the whole thing, like I said, it was four satellites. Right now, they're trying to, there's some that can work on three satellites. And I think, you know, maybe not now or maybe not in, like, 50 years, but I do think that it's going to be able to just work through, like, one satellite eventually. And, like, they're trying to figure that out. And I think just making it more efficient and, like, more quicker and stuff uh, is definitely going to be a bigger development in the future. All right, so another big hand uh, for our presenters. And well done, you four. And Zinia, you're going to have to create your own reception at home. Uh, we'll, I'll mail you some leftovers, right? Well, overnight you some leftovers. But everybody else, there is a reception.
Uh, and Crowley, please don't forget to sign in so we can appease our pet overboards, right? Uh, and uh, and also, uh, and Merchant, thank you all for coming and for supporting these. You're like hoping to get a question all of them. Thank you. <laughs> he did really well. Though.